Welcome back to the University of Queensland School of Architecture introductory series uh, concerning Grasshopper and Rhino. Now in this next series associated with the example uh, tower, we're going to start developing up the perimeter bracing walls of our CLT tower. Before we jump into developing the routine, I just wanted to take a bit of time to explain the logic behind it. In essence, what I'm assuming here is that a facade will be subject to a wind load. The amount of wind load I'm assuming to be generally the same in terms of the overall strength, but the effect is based on the length of the facade. So in some senses, like a, a sail, uh, the bigger the sail area with the, the force multiplied on it, uh, the greater the force um, applied. So uh, longer facade, more resistance needed, shorter facade, less resistance needed. Now in addition, the wind will typically come from one direction or another. Um, it's unusual for it to come from both directions, but if it does, I guess the um, effect will sort of neutralize each other to a degree. However, what I'm also assuming is that as the wind hits this facade, the cumulative resistance of both facades um, resisting that um, uh, force of wind will be calculated together. So although the force will be determined by the facade length on one side of the building, the resistance will be determined by the facade length on two sides of the building. Now, somewhat like a tree, as the wind blows onto the, the tower, the, the tower has a cantilever will want to deflect more towards the top. However, the resistance needed to counteract that bending will be uh, higher at the bottom and sort of tailing off at the top. And in addition, with the CLT panels, there's a sort of cumulative effect because each of them is sort of screwed into one another. And in addition, it's not a continuous structure like a steel, a welded steel or a um, in-situ concrete structure. It is fixings and brackets and, and screws and so on. So the behavior of it is different to other traditional materials. So in effect, as we get higher, the amount of resistance at the bottom will increase but at the same time the amount of resistance of shear wall or the amount of shear wall at the top of the tower will be less than the amount of, of shear wall at the bottom. Now that's the assumption and I'm basing this assumption on when I design my routine. An engineer would probably come in and, and have some different opinions but if we set up the parametric routine on this assumption we can always dial in different values based on external input. Now the final thing to add is as we get incrementally bigger as we go down. In a an in situ concrete situation, you really wouldn't want to form up each level of column a different size. So the amount of formwork increases because the amount of repetition decreases. But when you're using timber, it doesn't matter quite as much because the length of the uh, columns can be cut incrementally. Like the CNT machine doesn't really care if it's if it's changing its dimension all the way through. And I guess it just comes down to a, a building construction and coordination issue to make sure that the the sequence of the panels is delivered correctly and that they're put in the correct location in the building. So that's the inherent logic. So now getting back to the routine. I've picked it up again from the example tower stage 2 and I've cleaned up the, the routine a little bit and I'm going to work on that shear wall. What I'm going to do in the first instance is set up a couple of sliders to I guess set the coefficients of resistance from the top to the bottom. Now this coefficient will relate to the length of the facade and will vary according to the top which will have one coefficient value and the bottom which will have another one and then we're going to create a series between it and that will give us our step values through each of the levels for the length of the shear wall. I'm going to set up a, a number slider first and I'm going to 
um, give ourselves a, a floating point so that we've got a little bit more finer grain. So I'm going to call this facade resistance uh, co oops coefficient minimum, and I'll I'll bring that up to maybe two. Okay, and then I'll copy that. And I'll call this the maximum. Okay, to start this routine, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the northern facade first, or it'll in fact be the north and the south at the same time. And to do that, I'm going to grab the longest length of facade, which, which in this case will either be the curve going in or the curve going out. So that's going to be the longest curve. So what I'll do is I'll I'll set up a list uh, item filtering. So if we go uh, list um, item, and we're going to pull up the first oops the first item through here. And the list that we want will be the northern facade, which is the arc up here. So that's the list length, and we want to know how long it is. So we'll pull up the length of that there. So that's given us our starting parameter, which is the length of the, the longest facade on the north. Now what we're going to do is, now that we've got the length, we need to divide up this curve for a certain number of um, uh, resisting fins, I guess. And to do that, I'll give ourselves another number slider. Um, I'll give ourselves a reasonably big one. And so I'll call this the um, facade column spacing. And again, it doesn't really have to correspond with the CLT widths because they're going to be independent. We'll set that as a maximum of 6,000, so we're not going to overdo it. Okay. And the f what we're going to do is divide that length then by this spacing. And you can see here, the length of that facade was 45 meters, so it's going to divide down into 14.19. So, like the CLT, we're going to have to round that, so we're working with whole numbers. So if we pop that into there, so we can divide that up into 14. Now, what I'm going to do is start to do the maths to set up the series that will establish the step value as we go up through the tower. Now, in the first instance is I'm going to do the doubling of the facade. So remember, we've got the force coming on one side, but we've got two facades resisting it. Now, at the same time, I'm going to take out the columns from these sides because I don't want to double up on the, the corner columns. So what I'll do, and you just have to bear with me while I just work through this and, and the logic should become clear, is in the first instance I'm going to reduce the this number by one. So I'm reducing the number of columns well I will be reducing the number of columns that will be resisting the force on one facade to get rid of the corner and then I'm going to double it to account for the two facades. So I'll get, I'll copy this, I'll pop that in there, a doubling will be two and then I'll pop that into there. So if we, oops, if we see here we should have 26 columns that will be resisting the force. Now what I'm going to do is I'll determine the, the total force um, on the 
bottom facade and the total force on the top facade. Now that's going to be a product of the length of the facade that we've determined through here. And I'll just copy that to there. And it's going to be applied with the multiplication factor that we've got through here. So the minimum will be, if we pull that in through here, it will be there and the maximum which will be down the bottom will be here. Now we'll just adjust these sliders to be more realistic so um, a minimum coefficient might be about you know 0.36 perhaps and a maximum will do at 0.7. So the outcome of this will be a total length of the the top facade and the total length of the bottom. So we need a total length of uh, 32 meters for the bottom levels and a total length of 15.3 meters for the top. Now to figure out how much uh, resistance we'll need per column, oops, what we'll need to, sorry, what we'll need to do is to get this total length and divide it by the total number of columns that we've got. So that's the total length uh, through there and we'll divide that by that. So the, the length of each column at the top will have to be 5 uh, 589 and at the bottom uh, 1260. Now what we want to do is in order to establish the step size um, we're going to have to find the difference between the biggest and the smallest number and then divide that by the number of floors and then our series when we um, started off is going to to start from in this case the biggest one and reduce down so um, we're going to have to introduce a negative integer through there we'll do the subtraction first so we want to take biggest number and take that away. So what we'll have then is the amount that it's going to, the column's going to vary from top to bottom. We'll get a, a, a division and we'll get that figure and divide it by the number of floors. Pop that in there and we can create the series. So our start value, which will be down the bottom, will be this one here. The count is going to be the number of um, floors. So we'll come back to here. Uh, where are we? So we'll do the count of the floors and the step value will be that figure there but not forgetting it's going to be reducing so we're going to have to put a negative value into there so we'll go from there to there to there and if we pull a panel up there what you can see is that we've set up a series that from the bottom floor it will be 1260 and then we go all the way to the top where it will be um, it'll get to 589. We'll leave it there and we'll pick it up at the next video.